Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Ivan Herman, as you can see there from W3C. Um, we had a workshop in this room yesterday with, I think, about 50 people, if, if my overall feeling is right, uh, because W3C is getting interested by this topic and what I would like to see to talk about here, why? Why is there an interest at W3C about annotation in the first place? So there is a convergence of different communities that W3C is related to on annotation and that's something that has materialized the past few years actually, but, but more strongly the last year. First of all, there is the annotation of data, data published on the web. W3C has a, a, a history of dealing with different types of data. Uh, these days there is a separate group on, let's say, CSV data on the web, so all kinds of data, and this has to be annotated for various reasons. Uh, and I have only some examples here now that a lot of government publish their data, various types of data on the web, uh, mostly in CSV, but in other formats as well. Uh, they are used by journalists, by decision makers, whoever, and who obviously want to annotate the data. Uh, scientific publishing these days in many fields is getting to the point where publishing data is at least as important as publishing a traditional journal publication. But that of course requires annotation, etc. Video and image, that's something that we have met before, so this is something that we all know. W3C got involved with digital publishing the last year, year and a half. Um, and that's an area where annotation has become extremely important. Um, well, everyone who uses an e knows that you can annotate a, a book, but it's fairly limited and it's very restricted. Um, on the other hand, there is a strong move in the educational community today to move really digital. There are places, countries, schools where the whole curricula of, let's say, secondary schools uh, go fully on tablets and things like that. I, I go to Korea next week and, and I know that in Korea there are entire schools where public, uh, sorry, education is done through, of course, Samsung uh, iPads. Uh, sorry, uh, oh my God, I shouldn't have said that. So Samsung tablets. <laughs> uh, and there, of course, anything which is related to annotation is absolutely important. I mean, you can't do that with, without that. Um, and then, of course, we have the web pages, the regular web pages. I guess that a large majority of people here uh, are more on that side, and that's obvious that we need it. Uh, <clears throat> Doug, my, my co-organizer of the workshop yesterday, started the, his presentation yesterday by saying that the web is 25 years old, and the fact that we should have had annotation is also 25 years old. So we should have had that from the start. Well, we don't. But uh, there again, there are different types of annotation. There are uh, people who are really interested in sharing annotation, but there are a number of people who just want to uh, store the, their private annotation and they don't want to expose it for whatever reasons. And all these things are very important, and I don't want to spend too much time on this. Uh, just one thing that for a survey done by an organization uh, in 2013, asking the question in various organizations, what are the main issues that are important for them before all the internal training, etc., becomes, uh, you know, digital. And of course, there are some that are obvious, you know, related to content management system and ease of you know, uh, preparation of things. That's fine. Uh, but look at this one. It's almost 50% of the participants who said, essentially, annotation is an uh, absolutely important point uh, for them to, to really go digital in internal training. So, so these communities are around W3C. We have had contact with them. And interoperability is a key for all these applications. And that's why W3C thought that starting a standardization activity in this area is important and is even necessary. So crash course on W3C jargon. There are essentially, I mean, I don't go into all the details, two types of groups at W3C. There are things that we call community groups that are very easy to set up. It takes about 
I don't know, 20 minutes or less, uh, and a few days of approval from other participants. And off you go, you go there, you do things, you develop specifications, document, whatever. Uh, the output of a community group is not a standard. It doesn't go through a very stringent uh, process. Actually, there is no process whatsoever. The group decides for itself. But there is no IPR commitment of, of real importance. And unfortunately, whether we like it or not, we live in a world where IPR is around, and we have to deal with that. Uh, so that's one end of the spectrum. And the other end of the spectrum is a working group which has a very precise process. Some people might say it's too heavy, it's a matter of discussion, but there is a very uh, precise process. Uh, for example, any standard that is published at W3C through a working group has to undergo rigorous testing, interoperability proofs that have to be documented on all features that are described, things of that sort. And there is a W3C membership vote on, on the document before it's really declared as, as a standard. Um, but there is a very strong, essentially royalty-free IPR protection that is required from all members who participate in the group, which is a very important point, and that's what you know, leads to standards. And then a crash course on W3C process, because to set up a working group, we have to have a very clear and precise charter what the group will do. Uh, we have to have staff contacts and, and, and persons. And of course, we have to find the interested parties among the stakeholders, um, and the charter has to be accepted by the membership. Okay, crash course is over. So what we propose to do at W3C is to set up a working group. So really do the serious stuff, lead to a standard, um, and it's a group that would be difficult if we succeed in getting it, because we would have to have various stakeholders around the table, we want to have browser manufacturers around. We want to have web application developers around. We want to have publishers, and it's more than publishers because there is a whole industry behind the publishers who produce the electronic books, etc., that we may not see, but they exist and they play an important role. And of course, the data publishers and all those that use that. Um, it, may not be possible for us to get all the communities equally represented, but we really have to do whatever we can. So we have a draft charter that we did a few months ago, and uh, this is a, 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 a charter that we discussed yesterday, actually. Uh, so we, we put it, we had about an hour and a half discussion on various aspects of the charter. And we are, without going to all the details, these are the various things. Uh, uh, for some reason, the numbering went wrong, but forget about that. That's my mistake. Um, there are six items that we plan to develop as standards. The first one is an abstract data model for annotation. I think we can all agree that such data model is important, though that everybody who works in this space know what we are talking about and how these things can be interchanged. That is related to a specific vocabulary. This is, this is the, these are the terms that we use that not only humans but machines understand. We have to have an HTTP-based API because we all know that we want to store Possibly, We want to store annotation on various places. We want to create, we have to access, modify, search them, and, and do that on the web. We are talking about the web here. So some sort of an HTTP-based API is necessary. What we call the robust link anchoring, I am not absolutely sure that it is the best term, but to be honest, I haven't found anything better. But the point here is that we have to have anchors where we put the annotation on. And these anchors can be very complicated and dependent on what data we are talking about. And there has to be a standard way to do that. Now, yesterday there was a long discussion about this, and I will come back to some of the details on that. But that's certainly probably the toughest one in the whole group to properly define. That's, that's the feeling at least I have. And finally, we have to have a client-side API because if you will run in the browser, 
you want to have a, an API that is available for JavaScript uh, to develop application. What is missing here, and we deliberately did not put it here, is we do not want to define and standardize any kind of user interface paradigm or user interface approach. First of all, you know, this is, this is something that the community has to, has to find. W3C never goes into this area. It really just defines the basic building blocks and let the community exploit those and do the best they, they, they can. <clears throat> There are, the plan is that the charter would be, uh, sorry, the working group would be sort of divided in two, not disjoint, but essentially two subgroups, task forces. One that would take care of the data model and the vocabularies and maybe the serialization thereof. Uh, the client side uh, task force takes care of the anchoring part and of course the JavaScript API. And the HTTP API and the serialization, they are sort of spread both on, on both because they are really shared. And at the moment, the time is envisaged to be two, two and a half years. That includes all the, the testing, the rigorous testing, I mean the test suites first of all, and then the testing. Uh, and, and we'll see whether that's enough. Uh, as I said, we had a great workshop yesterday. We had a number of short presentations and they are all linked uh, from, from that URI. To be more precise, there are still some slides that are in my mailbox that I have to put up, but the original submissions are all linked in uh, from that page already. And we had a lot of discussions, as I said, on the charter itself. And there are some things that came up that were not in the original charter. I have not modified the charter itself yet, but it has to be done within a few weeks. Um, one thing, it's very important to provide hooks into the whole system so that both provenance and copyright slash licensing information could be added if needed or if necessary or if required. Um, we are not in the business of defining the licensing terms. We are not in the business of defining the provenance vocabulary, but we give places where this information can be added. Um, on the robust anchoring, again, we have to realize that uh, you know we cannot solve all the miseries of this world. So, so there will be data formats that we cannot even address. Uh, so, the way the robust anchoring structure should be defined is to leave extension points so that other data formats that come up uh, can add their own approaches uh, where, if they can and if they want. Uh, to well-defined places. And, and the, we have to be very careful because the first version that we had was really very HTML-centric, and that's fine. I mean, that's really the central thing for us because that's what W3C is, is, is really working on. But the charter should be better in, in you know, not excluding annotation on different types of data. Um, and, and do as much as we can in the data area, time permitting. But that's something that we will have to see. What was nice to see, as far as I'm concerned, is that there was a general agreement in the room that the main, the broad lines of the charter are, are sort of okay. I mean, that's, that's, that's a good sign. So the way forward is um, hopefully, you know, with a you know, one or two weeks, we will have a, a new version of the charter. It's already on the web, and we will have a new version there, which will incorporate the various uh, points that we discussed yesterday. Um, we also have to identify and, frankly, really personally approach the different stakeholders uh, to, to get them in this work. There were a lot of people here, but there were some areas, browser vendors, etc., who were not really represented yesterday, and we have to, to uh, stretch all those. And then we hope that uh, the formal uh, approval process can start sometimes in June, and if everything goes well, that means that we can start uh, the, the whole group sometimes early autumn, sorry, fall in this country, um, in, let's say in September. That being said, maybe some of you have read the book of Douglas Hofstetter, who has a Hofstetter's Law, 
uh, which is to essentially say it always takes longer than you plan, even if when planning you take off that are slow into account. Uh, you've had the, this example as an example for recursivity, and, and it's a very, very, very truthful statement. Uh, but, you know, maybe we could beat him on this time. Uh, just some for fun, I found some examples for myself that you know give some inspiration for things that we can do. Annotation is not new; it's not 25 years. It's much older than that. And this is a reproduction of a medieval manuscript where it's full of annotation. And as you can see, annotation is not only text. There is this drawing up there with you know, some kind of a dragon you know, eating the eye of a person being hanged or something very nice like that. No idea whether this has anything to do with the text itself or a monk was simply bored, but you know, we, we need annotation with graphics. Yesterday we had a long discussion about whether copyright on annotation is important or not, which essentially says whether an annotation par by itself may become something important or not. Now this is a really good example. This is the manuscript itself is on a 17th century novel, Chinese novel, which is one of the classics in Chinese novel, uh, the, the story of the Red Chamber. And there is an annotation which is done by an anonymous person. Nobody knows who that is. So the annotation is referred to as the red inkstone annotation. That's the way it's referred to in China. Don't ask me in Chinese. Um, and these annotations have become so important that it is the subject of scholarly studies in China because there are some aspects of the novel that can be understood only through these annotations, I was told. Uh, so, you know, this is the case when annotation by itself has a value and, and it's subject of, as I said, scholarly work. We have annotation of music. Whoever made music in his life knows that I, I remember when I made music, I had to annotate my, my music with you know, the fingers, how do I set the fingers, etc. So it's not only on text. And well, sometimes it's a bit overdone. Uh, when I was a student, I remember in the library uh, mainly people in the legal profession, I must say. They had the art of, you know, coloring the books in, in, you know, practical, there was no leftover of the original text. Everything was in different colors and styles. So we even have to do that. Thank you very much. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Any questions? Uh, Greg Kellogg, um, Yvonne, you mentioned you brought up uh, CSVLD as sort of an example, excuse me, CSV on the web, as an example of where we might annotate uh, spreadsheets to imbue meaning on them. Uh, one of the use cases there is to actually uh, create basically RDF where none, none existed before. Is, do you, do you imagine that that type of thing might be in the scope of annotations here? to be able to imbue more meaning that's, uh, human, that's machine process, processable through that, that? That may be, although uh, absolutely, but that being said, I had in mind something much simpler than that. I mean, journalists use this public data for all kinds of purposes these days, and, and you know, they want to share the annotations on, on what they do on the data. So it can be as simple as that, as well as adding essentially additional metadata on CSV to make it more understandable. So there's a whole spectrum there. Uh, Tom Kramer from Stanford University. Uh, I'm wondering if you could describe how use cases do or do not inform the proposed work of the working group, especially on the client side API. So, uh, yeah, the way the working group will, will work, and these are the details that will be in the charter, is that a use case document has to be produced. So the, essentially, from day one, the working group has to collect use cases, and everything that we do should be based on the use cases. Now, we are in a slightly more, a better situation than, than many of the working groups, because we have two sources of use cases that have been already collected. 
On the one hand, we have a digital publishing interest group, and the digital publishing interest group has published a set of use cases for annotation about, when was that, three weeks ago? Rob, where are you? Where are you? you were, yeah, about three weeks ago. So that document already exists, and we will use it as one of the input for this group. The other is that the open annotation model was done in an, uh, one of those community groups that I was referring to, and they also have use cases, although they, it hasn't been uh, thoroughly collected, it's sort of in the archives, and, and maybe they will do that. So we already have things to draw on, but yes, certainly use cases are important. Can you describe the, the considerations that you, know, you have regarding language, especially, especially um, languages using character sets other than you know, the English character set? Yeah, uh, that... So first of all, that's certainly something that we are extremely careful about. Uh, in general, WCC does a lot for internationalization. Now, uh, I hope that the model that we have is agnostic as far as the language and the character sets are concerned. But there might be issues on styling, for example, of, of, the, of the annotation bodies. Let's say if you want to do right-to-left writing, which is typically one of the very complex ones, Hebrew or Arabic, uh, that it has to be prepared for. That's, that's, it's not explicitly called out in the charter, at least not in the text that I said, but at W3C, any working group that we have have to go through the scrutiny of what we call an internationalization group that looks at these types of issues. Leave it for now. Um, so so that, that will happen in this case as well. Actually, go a little bit beyond that. Internationalization is one of those what we call horizontal activities. The other thing that is very important is to ensure accessibility of annotation. That's, that's another area where we will have to see with, with our experts uh, to have a scrutiny over, over the documents that we produce. Okay. Thanks, Ivan. Thank you very much.